when HIV hit the country, it was either attached to being gay or having been a sex worker, there was a lot of stigma. Nobody wanted to put a face to it. Nobody wanted to disclose their HIV status. People saw HIV as this death sentence. People in the community started dying, men, young women. We began to see the research data on women overseas. They were a growing proportion suffering from HIV. In many ways the most vulnerable because they had no ways to protect themselves. It took South African women, pregnant women, and mothers who had lost their children to say, enough is enough. We want to be in control of our bodies. The reality was that there had to be some kind of technology that women could control. If we didn't find that, then we would find it difficult to have a major impact on the Southern African epidemic. It really blew my mind. Here we were struggling to make sense and interpret the epidemiological data that we're finding. And here's somebody else, some 10,000 miles away, also thinking about what do we do? In 1991, there was a conference that was held about HIV prevention. It was here in Washington, and I was doing a workshop. I remember this one Ugandan woman, and she said, you know, look, if they can put a man on the moon, why can't they produce something that women can use? If all I have to offer women is a male condom, especially married women, I really have almost nothing to offer them because it's a choice between getting pregnant and having children or, or exposing yourself to a fatal disease. So I said, well, look, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll try to find out. She started talking to me about the need for something, I think at the time, called a viricide, then a microbicide. A microbicide is a chemical that women can place inside the vagina that will protect them against HIV infection or indeed other sexually transmitted infections. They tend to be given normally in the form of a gel. When I first started, there was no money going into microbicide research. The formula that was guiding HIV policy globally was ABC, abstinence, behavior change, and condoms. That was supposed to be the answer, and we were trying to say, well, that answer wasn't good enough. You can talk to a woman all day about being abstinent, but if she is sexually vulnerable to her partner, then abstinence isn't relevant for her. It was very, very hard for women to break down the doors and say, we need to be at the tables discussing HIV policy. You'd hear people say, oh, the jam and jelly ladies are here. Recognition of women living with and being diagnosed with and dying of AIDS was a fight. It was a long struggle to get that recognition, even here in the United States. We were up against the challenge of trying to create not just a new product, but a whole new product class, a concept that didn't exist. It's a hugely long, hugely expensive project, even under the best of circumstances. Lori was quite instrumental in getting activists together, getting scientists together, getting policy makers together. We were trying to do this by piecing together research from universities and small biotechs, raising money from governments. I think anytime that there's money, science will follow. For the first time, NIH put out a request for applications. They were seeking to get investigators working on vaginal physiology, vaginal immunology, and vaginal microbicides. So I like to say NIH discovered the vagina. The really big shift is when we captured the hearts and minds of HIV scientists. They brought their sophistication about virology and immunology to the challenge of developing a microbicide. 
The Global Campaign actually was launched officially in 1998. What we did is we invited people to join us. We put our goals out there and said, if you agree with these goals, please join on. The Global Campaign from the get-go had multiple goals. One was to mobilize political will and to try to get actually a product and the science behind it. Another was to really change the way in which research was done, not only to safeguard the health and well-being of women involved in clinical trials, but to really have their involvement and participation and leadership. In that sense, the global campaign was really a pioneer. Men still use power to control decision-making relationships. People were inspired by the idea, and so they started working with us. We know that it's a complex but evolving issue, and I think we're seeing a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. We wanted to be accountable to the people that we were trying to work with and work on behalf of. We have too many phase three trials that don't. So we had this international steering committee, and. It was sort of like our board, not as good as the modern and methods they means, would but guide it does us. Seem to have some action. However, the lessons for the microbicide field was that recruitment, retention, and adherence. The steering committee was an extended uh, voice of advocacy in North America, America, in Europe, and in South Asia, and in Africa. They actually ended up working with about 55 partners, and they got about 300 organizations to, to sign on to the importance of their work. They received funding so from a half a dozen foundations and USAID. As a grassroots movement, we designed a political strategy, and we were very calculating about it. GCM recognized early on that Big Pharma wasn't going to come to the table. Most companies don't see big markets in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. They realized that if they developed a product like a microbicide, it would end up being given away. So here in the United States, for example, we lobbied. We established outposts in the backyards of key congressmen who had a say on funding decisions. We're out in the streets. That swell of activism in the U.S. made itself go global. I can remember going to all of the international reproductive health and rights meetings that did not have HIV in the agenda. Women from South Africa and from Uganda and from South Asia and from the Caribbean who were also just in the nascent stages of just even giving word to what their struggles with AIDS were at that time. We did all the things that grassroots movements do to get attention to their issue and to sway public opinion. From just a few voices and bodies trying to do things, the landscape changed quite substantially. By the early 2000s, we had gained enough kind of political weight here in the U.S. that we were able to introduce the Microbicides Development Act in Congress, which was going to demand and authorize a whole microbicides program. Although we never got the act passed, we actually got everything in the act by other means. It was the vehicle through which we educated Congress. The global campaign's voice was heard uh, loud and clear. We saw many players coming into the party to actually fund microbicides research. By 1999, there was 28 million, and then 10 years later, there was 178 million. The money allowed the science to progress, and the science shifted from laboratories in the US and Europe to needing to test the product in human beings. Global Campaign made a concerted effort to be in those countries, one, where the need was the greatest, and two, where there were already clinical trials in development and you needed to go where the fire was burning to put it out. This is where it was, in Sub-Saharan Africa. This was urgent. It was urgent for us to get up and running. 
GCM went very humbly to Africa and other parts of the world. People are not just subjects in research, they're active participants. We need to treat them as such. And it's a partnership. And I think you started to see that in how the clinical trials were run. What the GCM movement did was to let Africans do what they know it's best for them. And something positive came out of it. A sense of trust, a sense of empowerment, a sense of ownership. Because we had a broader network of being able to ask questions about ethics. Older men, what do you think about it? It's about conduct, about the support and the compensation that women might have received in those clinical trials. Why do you think it's the right thing for them? It was very difficult to convince women at the beginning to participate in research. They didn't understand what research is. How can I trust an American product? Trust it plays a major role. We overcame the challenges by being patient, being open and being honest to them. Their needs and concerns were translated up the chain to scientists and researchers who could then acknowledge their needs and take them into account. That was revolutionary and now has become a fundamental part of how clinical trials are conducted in this country and around the world. And I think that GCM should be proud of the role that we've played in that. We always expecting positive results, but sometimes results are not as what we would want. There was a lot of negativity from the media, a lot of stigma when someone uses vaginal gel. Most of these myths come from men. So we had to make sure that we demystify the myths that are within our communities. With the support of GCM, we, most of the time we would be the first one to hear about any negative outcome of the study. They would facilitate the process of coming up with um, question and answers or how to respond to any negative question that may come from the community. We took up the local community radio stations, the local newspapers, we wrote articles. Good morning to you, my name is Donald. Yes, do you have any questions related to what we're talking about this morning? And more than welcome to call us. Joseph, good morning. I did several interviews at the local level. And they don't understand some of the terms. Fortunately, our side of the story was heard. Do you see macrobicides as a way to empower women? Yes, I think... If this product doesn't work, it doesn't mean it's the end of microbicides. We will say men don't Global campaign's role was to manage expectations from various stakeholders. It's about managing it all the way, that this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. We need to go on and on and on until we get there. I will always remember the day... It was the 1st of June. I read the article on the first successful trial in the New York Times. We finally had a product that showed some protection. The front page picture was of a group of South African women who had been gathered together to hear the trial results. GCM had insisted that the women who were participants in the trials be included because it made such a difference in making things better for their futures. I burst into tears when I saw that newspaper picture. Now, 39% is not by any stretch of the imagination, you know, a fantastic result. In fact, it's a very borderline result, but it gave us a lot of hope. We have a lot more hope and promise for a woman-initiated method today than we did for the past 20 years. For the better part of 14 plus years, the global campaign for microbicides was carving a niche for women's voices to be the clarion around ensuring that women's prevention remained a priority. 
the global campaign for my website transformed many lives. The movement assisted so many women to, to say that we can do it. When women explore and share and evolve and change, so do men. <laughs> The microbicide trial and just the product itself and negotiating it started a conversation between couples that I don't think would have started of its own accord. We've taken the whole community at the next level of understanding. The fact that there are women who understand their power in determining what happens in their communities and in their lives around research, around clinical trials, around their understanding of the role that that research plays in their lives, is all due to the global campaign for microbicides.